eh, de parte del Congreso simplemente hacer una breve síntesis eh, vinculada al legado educativo del profesor Ascot, en primer lugar eh, se refiere a el docente como, como explorador, y, y, y en particular esto, eh, esta característica, eh, ustedes la pueden encontrar en el texto que nos regaló Roy Ascot para el inicio de, del congreso que está en el programa, eh, como una forma de inspirar y una forma de eh, generar eh, comentarios. El otro legado importante desde el punto de vista educativo es el concepto de tecnoética, como una convergencia entre las metodologías, teorías y prácticas educativas. Aunque el profesor Ascot eh, en su propio texto, Mis docentes, él diga que el Ichin y el Tao han sido sus maestros más duraderos, desde el punto de vista educativo, Ascot concentra la figura del maestro, no como aquello que se debe enseñar, sino el camino del creador en una multiplicidad de áreas enlazadas por la tecnología. Muchas gracias, profesora Ascot, y damos la bienvenida a eh, sus presentadores, el profesor Rizal Krusinski desde Polonia y la experta en nuevos medios, Ángela López Ruiz, desde Uruguay. Adelante, Richard. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, this is a great honor to, to, to talk about Roy, Roy Ascot. Uh, actually, uh, for me, this is, this is something very, very personal uh, because it was, I think, somehow mid-90s when I had a chance to give a talk at Primov Conference. First, in the extended... Uh, the, the first, I think, it was when 1906 or something, when I had an opportunity to talk. Later on, we, we collaborated on some project. Uh, Roy was so, so nice to contribute a text. I think two, three texts to different publications of mine. So this is actually actually very, uh, very personal. But I, I want to, to, to focus on to some, what is the most important for me in the, in the approach, in the position, in the contribution of Roy Ascot. To, to contemporary art. And there are few categories I have to, to, to mention just to, to, to show how it is important. So first is interactivity. Uh, and it was something like 2011, I think, there was the exhibition in, in, uh, in, in London uh, presenting works of, of, of Roy. And uh, I had an opportunity to to to, to experience uh, for a, for a while and, uh, change paintings works from the late fifties and beginning of of the sixties. Uh, so this is actually the beginning of um, the history of uh, interactive art, late fifties, early early fifties, uh, early sixties. And in the same time, uh, it was continued by a very important uh, concept, the most radical uh, in, the, in the theory of interactive art. The statement, uh, um, I, I, I repeat, maybe not very precisely, that Roy Ascot wrote uh, that interactive artist is a designer. Uh, but this is the designer who designed the field of creative activity of the audiences of the viewer. So uh, from, the, from the very beginning, actually, we could observe how art uh, has been open towards uh, participants, towards uh, those who not only want to experience somebody else's work, but, uh, but also to contribute something from his or her uh, side. So this way, since late 50s, has been developed the program for art inviting participation from the side of, his, of its audience. So uh, the next 
category uh, I want to, 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 to mention is uh, telematics, which is extremely important, I think, for, from the contribution of, of, of Ray R. Scott to, to our contemporary art field. And again, it was, I think, uh, Electra exhibition in Paris, uh, in the Museum de la Ville de Paris in 1983, and La Plissure, the text, the work, opening um, uh, the field of artistic creativity in between continents involving several participants using different tools of communication to contribute to the artwork, which was actually the process. So that it is already in the very um, center of, of the concept of interactivity, that artwork becomes the, the process. Any time when uh, I engage in any change painting, I transform the object into into the process. But in 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 the, the preceding text, uh, we had to do with the process involving several participants. So the process itself, communication, and, and activity breaking the borders between between. Uh, participants between uh, places they they just spending the time uh, and contributing the work uh, were uh, disappearing and the third concept this is the post biological i think extremely important again we are talking about the world and uh, we could experience via technology uh, we can manipulate the technology or we can create with the technology so uh, actually there is no no way to to deal with the world nowadays not being engaged involved in, in technological concept so uh, there is no nature there is no biosphere uh, anymore we have to do with with techno digital bio zones organized in the new construction, new architecture of the world. So around those three concepts, uh, interactivity, uh, telematics, and post-biological world, I first of all uh, see the, uh, the art, the concept, the idea, the theories uh, of, of Roy Ascot. And in the same time, uh, I understand, I know very well, that I, I just, uh, I'm touching just few points uh, of the very rich, very, uh, very developed, huge area of artworks, of ideas, of influences. So uh, I just want to remind also that Roy Ascot was the first who got the very special golden Nike prize from Mars Electronica in 2014 from a visionary pioneers of, of media art. So maybe vis visionary, I should also indicate in, in the portrait of, of Roy Ascot. And this is what I wanted just to, to, to to propose for the for the beginning of our conversation of our meeting with with Roy Ascot. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Gracias, Richard. Adelante, Angela López Ruiz, por favor. Bueno, muchas gracias por este momento. Eh, Es un placer para mí presentar a Roy, es un artista que admiro inmensamente por, por todo su pensamiento desarrollado en estos años y también por sus prácticas artísticas. Eh, bueno, eh, yo preparé un pequeño texto basado, eh, más allá de todo lo que ya mencionó Richard, acerca de sus eh, prácticas interactivas referidas a la cibernética, a la telemática, Quería también eh, hacer hincapié en un intenso estudio que ha desarrollado eh, Roy acerca de la expansión de la conciencia y la realidad sincrética. Me interesa eh, señalar sobre todo eh, la interpelación que hace 
al pensamiento de Freud de imaginarse a un ser humano como un ser unificado y la propuesta de Roy de pensarnos a nosotros mismos como seres múltiples. Entonces, eh, ¿cómo integrar esta dimensión que propone Roy en el campo del arte? Para esto quiero citar una obra colectiva, eh, me refiero a eh, Planetary Network, realizada en 1986, eh, donde Roy eh, participa dentro del equipo de curadores de esa obra. Se trata de 100 artistas de tres continentes que están interconectados en vivo a través de computadoras, faxes, tomas de televisión, videotextos, etc. Esta acción se realizó durante 14 días en Venecia y luego siguió por un tiempo más. Eh, traigo esta obra, dada la, esa interactividad en vivo, como un eh, reflejo de esta, este significante eh, que estamos viviendo hoy, eh, en este contexto que estamos compartiendo incluso. En esa obra, eh, Roy propone romper el estatuto de ser artista para ser participante del arte. Y en este caso es lo que propongo también ahora a través de esta obra anticipatoria, visionaria o quizás vidente, el compartir eh, este momento que estamos como eh, un estatuto de participantes, además de estarlos escuchando activamente a Roy. Gracias. Hello. Thank you. Uh... I can't see you on my full screen, so uh, I don't know how I, how I manage that, but... Um, okay, shall I start now? Adelante. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, um, well, I've talked, um, called this talk. First of all, let me say what an honor it is to be part of this really, yeah, really good. important occasion. I think it's wonderful what has been arranged and the Uh, the, the the artists uh, who are involved. It, it is really, an, and uh, I'm really honored to be part of this. Um, and I would like very much uh, uh, to thank Delma, of course, for arranging this and Ricard and Angela for their, their recent comments in uh, outlining some of the things I've been trying to do over the last 50, <laughs> 50 or more years, I'm afraid it is. Um, however, so let's start. I've called this the Tao of Technoetic Art um, because I wanted to talk about the Tao, my way, my pathway through it, um, in considering art uh, as an organism. So let me start uh, by saying that I think art as an organism uh, is a living form which grows and embraces all other kinds of, and interacts with all other kinds of organisms. And if we see art in that way, we immediately see art education and art schools and art colleges and galleries and critics and theorists, all part of this organic whole. Next slide, please. You have the next slide, please. Uh, so I just bro broadly there give some definitions of, uh, of technoetics. Um, and I'll read them out a little bit because they are being translated, I know, um, as I speak. that So technoetics is a convergent field of practice uh, that seeks to explore consciousness and connectivity through digital, telematic, chemical or spiritual means. I, I think I do want to lay importance from the very start on the fact that our connectivity and the future of our practice in art is not simply a digital and telematic. I think it will involve the chemistry of the brain, and I think it will begin to embrace more spiritual attributes. Um, so then uh, also we have, as, as Rickard has kindly mentioned, the question of what I call moist media, uh, which is a part of this technoetic field. So technoetic comes from the Greek uh, noesis, mind, technology, mind, and um, uh, uh, technology and consciousness. I want to speak also about the effect of all of this technology on our thinking. I think what this has done is to create a hypercortex, 
Uh, that's to say, with minds interacting in the net, we're producing a global network of collective cognition. Um, and uh, so the hypertext, hypercortex is the, the whole sort of world system of thinking, which is both open-ended uh, and emergent. The next slide, please. The next slide. So this is just a little cloud. I'm not obviously going to um, expect this all to be translated nor to speak to it, but just to just to show the kind of um, cloud of thought, the connectivity between fields, disciplines, ideas, and sensibilities that our field that we're all involved in now embraces. But central to all of this for me uh, is cybernetics, the theory of cybernetics. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, and uh, before I discuss fully the nature of cybernetics, I'd like to introduce my way into all of this field, how I first became involved in the, in the first instance with technology and how really that informed my practice, not simply my um, digital sort of computer practice, but the early interactive work that I set up. I served my um, military service, uh, national service, as an officer in the fighter control branch of the RAF. Uh, and that was where we're concerned in the Cold War uh, with the possibility of, 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 of aircraft flying over the North Sea and bombing us. And so my job was to look down on this sort of tabletop that you see here, which was feeding in information from radar um, about the, the, the behavior of aircraft over the North Sea in real time. And uh, this was plotted, and this is the interesting point to me, not by one radar report from one radar signal, but three differently placed across the coastline, f uh, focusing on the behavior of one aircraft. So instead of this sort of, how do I say, binary thought, which we're very used to uh, in, in Western thinking, uh, this sort of tertiary thing, three, three positions were always always assessed to find the true position of and movement of the aircraft. So and I think, um, I think equally uh, the tabletop um, started its uh, <laughs> impression on my mind in a, in a certain kind of way. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I should speak very, very briefly um, about my time as a student. I'm trying to find this pathway to explain to you because I think it is very useful. Um, I studied, uh, after I'd done my military service, I went to the university to, to study with Victor Passmore um, and Richard Hamilton. Um, and I think uh, Passmore, perhaps less known, uh, for me a wonderful um, non-figurative abstract artist, constructivist artist, and Richard Hamilton, I think, very well known as the father of pop art and all that sort of thing. Um, but but ha Hamilton's importance to me was he introduced me to Duchamp and above all to the glass um, and to the complexity of meaning and the openness of interpretation that Duchamp uh, provided with the work uh, that he gave us, that uh, no message was fixed everything was open for interpretation for the viewer to enter into the picture. And in this course, the case of this, um, of the great glass on the left that you see here of the slide, um, of course, he made the whole environment uh, available, uh, open and part of the work uh, in an important kind of way. Certainly working with glass became important to me. And the third influence in my time as a student and my thesis um, in turn was on the very late watercolors of, Marce of, of um, Paul Cezanne. And in those very late watercolors, you'll see the beginning of everything that's important to us in digital uh, and, 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 and current art today. That's to say that the viewer is invited to make meaning. All those bodies, all those trees, all those clouds in this little painting you see here, which is actually quite a large painting, uh, in the painting here are fluid. They're not fixed. And, do, and uh, 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 Cezanne was effectively in this work and many other works saying, no, it's up to you. It's up to you to resolve this work. 
you enter into this, this work is an organism that you will enter into, you will resolve its complexity. So those three sort of things were very important to me. On the one hand, Duchamp, the use, the, the, the uh, making ideas visible, Passmore constructing a new space, and Cezanne inviting the viewer in. So this resulted in the first work that I made, um, these change paintings. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, well, this this was a ne next slide after this one. Sorry, next next slide. Yeah, so there there you see, I was started making these works, um, which were sort of seeds, really, of a, of of a potential open ended work. That each time the viewer moved the slid the um, the, the the glass uh, panels, um, a, a new work was was created. So the viewer became part of the process uh, and the viewer actually resolved the work, which was never actually never ending. It was always open to change and always open to uh, interpretation. Next slide, please. Next slide. So the first show I had in, um, uh, in London, I want to show you because I tried to make the catalog into a kind of, um, uh, you know, a more reference book. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, yeah, this, uh, so we go, uh, so it, in it, I tried to describe, I'm not going to read this to you, I just wanted to make the point that the first show that I had in London, I wanted um, really to make a diagram of the function of the work. I felt it was important as a supplement to the work itself to so sow its social place and by implication, my and our social responsibility uh, as artists. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I'm, I can't read those today, but I'm talking about epistemological hardware, um, about uh, systems, uh, participation, and also the importance of diagram space, because it seems to me that drawing um, in the 21st century, that uh, drawing has moved from that other kind of representation that we inherited from the Re Renaissance into the, essentially the diagram. I don't just mean drawings with straight lines and arrows and circles, but I mean that drawing which attempts to be a notation for change, notation of transformation that's taking place in whatever we're viewing or feeling. Next slide, please. So this piece, which is now in the Tate Gallery, um, had, was accompanied in the in the catalogue um, by this sort of um, reference, and I, I, call, I was calling these pieces metaphors, uh, just as we have metaphors, which are the best way, as Nietzsche said, you know, all truth is metaphor. You know, there's no ultimate truth that we can deal with, but we can form metaphors which approach the truth of whatever we're uh, trying to understand. So I think forms can be um, metaphorms uh, in that sense, and they have open for meaning. And so, again, with the participation middle panel, you see there's a little red stripe there that the viewer can move back and forth as if to, to move between interpretations of one metaphorm, um, which includes the idea of, 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 of a bottle, womb, umbrella, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. So very briefly, that's just to refer to a couple of books of mine that have talked about this. Next slide, please. So let's talk about cybernetics a little bit, because we're not just simply, of course, talking about machines and computers. We're talking, in fact, my first introduction to cybernetics uh, was a book by Ross Ashby called Design for a Brain. So it was actually a biologist for me who first introduced the importance of cybernetics, which is concerned with, as Norbert Wiener said, control and communication um, in um, animal and in machine, in nature <coughs> and in artificial systems. <coughs> 
control and communication. That is looking at the whole as an organism and seeing how all the parts interact. And so for art, the parts are the work itself, the artist's consciousness, and the viewer. And all three are involved in an interaction. So the study of art really is best really understood as the study of cybernetics. Of course, it also included robotics, which we're quite interested in now. Um, Warren McCulloch's work on cognitive science, which is of course left to led to artificial intelligence and hopefully may lead eventually to artificial general intelligence, but that's a little bit along the way. And of course, Norbert Wiener's book on cybernetics. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, I, I, before moving on, I must mention the work of Stafford Beer. Um, Stafford Beer, uh, Allende uh, in Chile, uh, commissioned Stafford Beer uh, to implant a, a nervous system into, into uh, Chilean society. And uh, Stafford Beer did many wonderful things for the time, the short time he worked for Allende. Um, you know, notably um, getting the reports on the, um, uh, on the budget and, and the spending of the country and the gross national product um, up to date much, much more quickly than any, any country in the West was able to do. But as you know, um, uh, uh, Allende was, was, was effectively murdered. Um, and and uh, that was the end of Stafford Beer's work. But he created this um, very, very interesting situation uh, in which feedback from all the industries, from all the output, from all the agricultural product were cybernetically brought together uh, to enable one to have an overview of the whole. I'm just pointing out how this idea of cybernetics and the organism stretches from society uh, to the artworks that we make. Next slide, please. Next slide. And but then, of course, in 1974, I mean, I'd been looking at cybernetics and and seeing how important it was. But in 1974, Heinz von Forster dropped a bomb <laughs> in the sense that he said, look, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're all right. Uh, you're looking at the world in terms of interacting systems and so on. But there's one thing you've left out in all of this. And that's the viewer. <laughs> Until science recognizes that the viewer, that the analyst, that science investigator is a part of the system that's being analyzed, then we will not get a true sense of what, uh, how nature proceeds or, or how systems can be developed. So the introduction of second order cybernetics was hugely uh, important to the sort of theory that underpins the kind of work that more generally we're all involved in. And of course, that became uh, part of the understanding of this relationship between the viewer, the artwork and the artist, that the viewer, that the art is a system which includes the viewer and the artist. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. So uh, uh, I'm very, very briefly, uh, I'm not, I, I could talk about this a long time, but I do want us to remember in all of this, uh, as we go further with AI, artificial systems of perception and understanding our own cognitive and perceptive systems, that there are what I would call second order senses as well, which are completely ignored in Western society or have been. Um, uh, that's to say, uh, all these ideas that we uh, associate with intuition, with with the psychic, with the spiritual, with uh, all these other domains, the occult, all these things which are absolutely forbidden in Western society, actually um, begin to take on some importance again. For example, the chemistry of the brain has introduced us, not introduced us, has allowed us better to understand many of the practices that we would call primitive which exist, as, to my experience, particularly, for example, in Brazil today and elsewhere in South America, where plants are used to transform consciousness, to create other states of, of, of awareness, uh, other states of, of being. Um, and I think we're just beginning to move towards that understanding um, that, the, uh, that the relationship between the chemistry 
pharmacological processes and the brain and perception and understanding and learning are going to be at least as important as artificial intelligence developments. And if they're separated, and if one, if the mechanical AI is given preference over the study of the chemistry of the brain, I think it will be to our disadvantage. So I think as artists too, and certainly in art schools, we have to begin to introduce these understandings of the ways in which um, uh, the, the thinking, consciousness, perception um, are altered and can be managed as much by the chemistry uh, which are brought, uh, which is brought to bear as it is with mechanical electronic uh, systems. Next slide, please. Next slide. So that's the that's the first time I made a statement about. Um, uh, about all this in, in, in the scientific literature, when I talked about um, behaviorist art, as I called it, really I was talking about um, uh, talking about behavior, identity, chance, change, process, system, interaction, and transformation as the key words which would determine our development in art and enable us better to understand what contemporary artists are doing. And that also has informed my, my teaching. Next slide, please. Next slide. So next slide. So just to remind you that the tabletop has many functions. Uh, bottom right is the work that I had, uh, which was tabletop being changed in real time in the Shanghai Biennale, where visitors could come across and thump on the table um, and change images which were also being changed through a telematic network and broadcast on the tabletop. And on the top left you see all that interest in the 19th century in consciousness uh, which was worked out uh, with these um, uh, transmissions with the spirit and so on and so forth. Uh, and bottom of it also the importance of the land. This is a very very old map uh, I think it's a 16th century map of a Neolithic um, earthworks near me in, in where I live, um, and uh, uh, which is trying to set out the significance uh, of these stones and pathways uh, to, to Neolithic men. So all of this has to do with, with mapping, with planning, with, with, with interacting and, and looking down. Next slide, please. So, so for me, the tabletop is a really, really important thing, whether that tabletop has physical elements uh, which viewers can use or whether it is um, actually a projection uh, through telematic systems. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so that was the, the way, that was how it worked at the... Um, at the Biennale in Shanghai, which of course is there was there was no language attached to it. Uh, there was a tabletop with pieces on it and two chairs and a box of pieces, and people came and made of it what they would. And that's what interested me: that meaning can be made out of the interaction between people, uh, even without uh, with even without a context, even without a framework. That we're we're meaning making people. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, well, that's a, that's another placemat <laughs> for the dinner table. Um, but trying to talk about um, the these areas that I, I have in mind of, of the uh, the reality, which I think is uh, made up um, is a very variable reality from the artist's point of view. Though we're using a technoetic approach or a moist media approach. Um, and the kinds of spaces that we now operate in are very varied. Um, uh, we have physical space presence, which is in eco space. We have a, a sort of vibrational presence at nano space. When we go to nano level, all matter is vibration. We have cyberspace, of course, um, which we're using, uh, entering into now. And there's this other one, as I say, I don't want ever to leave out of the equation in our understanding of where art is moving, and that is what I would call psychic space. Uh, so we're involved with connectivity, which is a, a way of dealing with a cultural coherence, uh, 
we're dealing with a field consciousness, which leads to a sort of spiritual coherence. And we're talking about world building, which is bottom up. Uh, as physics develop, it will move for the quantum level upwards, we have no doubt, from the nanoscale uh, up to the human scale. Next slide, please. Next slide. So let's uh, talk about introduction to telematic art. There's a no next, for a previous slide. Sorry. Uh, slide before. <clears throat> Yeah, so basically we're looking at the, what I call the five-fold path is the Tao telematic connectivity of minds and machines, immersion in the hybrid space of a variable reality, um, interaction with transmodalities of media and systems, both physical, electronic, spiritual, uh, 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 and um, chemical, and transformations of images and forms and consciousness. And uh, really... This is about emergence, and the whole of the movement in art now is about emergence, emergent meaning, not meaning given by the artist, but meaning emerging from interaction of the viewer with what the artist has provided. And I mean that on all levels, not simply on pressing buttons or putting things and sliding panels. I mean paintings, images, photographs themselves, which through their usually ambiguity, invite and afford the possibility of transformations of meaning on the part of the viewer. Everything is open now. Next slide, please. Next slide. So this is very briefly to remind of the Plissidu text, which was our first opportunity. Frank Popper, the historian, invited me to take part in this exhibition called Electra back in 84. And there we had, I think it was 12 or 14 locations around the world uh, on the back of the IP Sharp uh, time sharing network for us to exchange images, well, text making images <laughs> and text to create um, um, uh, a fairy tale. So each location across the world uh, became a part of a, a character in a fairy tale and the story developed from there. Next slide, please. Next slide. And then uh, you know, Ars Electronica, um, a, 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 actually through Richard, uh, no, uh, various people I shouldn't name, but because there was a collective of, of very generous minds that um, uh, invited me and found the funding to create this piece. But it was called Aspects of Gaia, and really, we sent out a call through fax, through email before its time, but electronically and, and, and so on, for images and um, texts about the nature of Gaia, about the Earth, um, and, um, uh, and digital pathways through it. And it was, it was, I think it was a useful piece because it enabled me to see how, both through this railway that went around the building and on the screens in tents above it, there could be an interaction both of screen and physical space uh, interacting with the, with the world and with, with um, players throughout the world. So I'm very grateful to Oz Electronica uh, for, for enabling that to take place. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Just say I'm, I'm part of it. Next slide. So I want to talk about, since I know there is some interest in teaching and art education in this, in this uh, conference and seminar, I've, I've been working in various places, London, Toronto, San Francisco, Vienna, Plymouth, and Shanghai over the last many years. Very briefly, next slide, please. Um, uh, I started in London um, at Ealing School of Art. Next slide. <laughs> Um, and I called it the ground course. Next slide. Um, this was the sort of ideas and so on I threw at students uh, when we started, um, trying always to introduce um, wherever possible ideas about genetics, uh, about uh, biology, about computers, um, and even uh, the earliest form of communication, which hadn't really quite come on board yet. 
uh, to them from the start in their thinking. Next slide, please. Largely by um, bringing a very diverse group of artists together to look at these questions of identity, uh, environment, and behavior. Um, and those were the sort of key factors uh, in which people took on not just a, a new persona, but created, next slide, please. Next slide. But created what I call a calibrator. These are students building, building calibrators in which they would take a situation that they're in. They would build these calibrators, which, which would look at the nature of the behavior of people in that space, the nature of the environment itself, um, and, uh, uh, and the systems that were working within that environment and determined from that a set of artificially, a set of actions. So they became, as it were, a new person. They, they, they acted out. Next slide, please. Next slide. They acted out uh, roles, it was not exactly role playing, but character creating in which they interacted then as a small group to invent a game. In other words, but that, that meant there were extreme limitations on their behavior that changed according to the weather, according to the people in the room, to various kinds of constraints. They were constantly aware of changes of the environment, socially and physically, and then changed their behavior artificially in relation to it, and then tried to work as an organism, as a group of six students, to invent a game, and then actually to build it under some of these limitations. So for example, uh, one would operate the calibrator as the guy on the top left is with a little calibrator or down the bottom left, uh, which he designed and say, well, you know, this is the time of day, there are three people in the room. Um, I, I, I can use wood, um, I can't use my hearing, I, uh, these are limitations on my behavior, these are limitations on things, how do I move next? Uh, so it's a complex thing to try to describe in five minutes, but essentially what we were looking at was to sort of enable the student to examine themselves through the limitations that could be set upon them artificially in the environment. Uh, and then to see that a work can be produced out of that, that, that they can then go back in and, and analyze through their direct experience. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Well, this is some of the books, you know, in those in that early period that had a quite a, uh, a lot of uh, effect on me. Uh, and they stretched, as you see, I mean, Roland Barthes uh, was talking exactly about what we're now involved in, absolutely, uh, that the, uh, the pleasure of the text uh, uh, becomes uh, the case when the reader becomes the, effectively the writer of the text essentially the, the text that is offered is sufficiently open to allow the reader to become the writer of the text. At the same time, a whole lot of books were coming out on electronic meetings, which of course eventually led on to, as I had the good fortune to meet with some of these people very early on, like um, uh, Jacques Vallée uh, in, in Paris, uh, who, who then moved to, um, to California, um, and um, Ross Ashby, um, uh, who I've mentioned already. Uh, and of course, importantly in all of this well was Fritz Hoff Kappa's book, The Tao of Physics, which attempt to bring together even Eastern ideas myst of, of mysticism and so on with the possibilities of, of the new communication environment. So all these things added up uh, to the sort of field that I was working with. Next slide, please. I know I have to move on now. Next slide. Next, next slide. Uh, then I moved to Toronto. Next slide. Uh, and there I had a, a very, it was actually the largest art college in North America at the time. And of course, I had all these old things like a Department of Fine Art, Department of Graphic Design, Department of Fashion Design, Department of Industrial Design, which seemed to me to be completely 19th century in its thinking. So I wanted um, instead. Uh, uh, 
a completely new curriculum that looked at information, behavior, environment, in the way I've talked about, but at a much more, uh, how to say, developed, sophisticated level than what I had, of course, planned for just a foundation uh, called mm -hmm. London. So over four years were given over to this, and the map on the left, which I, I can't go into detail, but that map um, and ways of, 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 um, uh, of, of carving up creativity, as it were, uh, in, into, re into real world, world activity, was sent out to all students in their second, third and fourth years to tick off all those elements that interest them. We then fed that back together uh, to create classes, to create subjects that could be taught uh, and studied and worked on. So we built bottom up from the desires of students um, into the possibilities that were afforded by the team that we had. Next slide, please. Next slide. So these are the areas of uh, the thing was divided up not into fine art, graphic design, industrial design, but looking at information, structure and concept from the point of view always of speculation, that is what is possible, theory, what is known, analysis of how to examine it and how it can be applied socially. So out of those elements, a student would sort of navigate a pathway and we would provide, we would create, if you like, classes out of that, studios out of that and hire staff and artists and czars, uh, designers and architects in to support that practice. Um, next slide, please. By the way, it was way too radical. It lasted, <laughs> it lasted a year. Um, and then I moved to San Francisco as the Dean uh, of the San Francisco Art Institute. Next slide, please. So down there, I won't go into the details of the Art Institute, but one thing that when I developed there, which has lasted was the Center for Critical Inquiry, which has now become, um, uh, you know, the research program that I've run for 20 years. But I think it's interesting to look at the people that um, I brought together there to talk about uh, how inquiry into art and society might be developed uh, with Angela Davis, of course, who's still very, very active now. Um, and um, uh, anyway, other names will be known to some of you and others, uh, others will not. But there is quite an interesting group of um, thinkers and artists and scientists there who kindly came together for us to start to do, understand the kind of field of inquiry that as artists uh, we could be uh, engaged in that would constitute art theory <laughs> as distinct from the art theory, which is sort of 19th century based, where you simply look at paintings and dream up sort of ideas about why they were created. Um, this was attempting to, to dig deeper. Next slide, please. It was at that time that I was introduced, by the way, to networking down at Stanford uh, Research Institute. I'd never, ever heard of it before. Um, a, a friend of mine who worked at a new center there of, of uh, consciousness studies um, introduced me to the fact that Texas Instruments had this, this like sort of typewriter that you could plug into a telephone and you could put in a code. <laughs> and this was early kind of networking um, back in 77. Uh, um, and uh, they very kindly, um, Texas Instruments uh, let me have a dozen of their tape, of their machines you see there, you just plug in uh, to, the, to the telephone. And so I got them just sent out to various artists um, like Douglas Davis and people like that um, around America and Europe. And we did the first sort of online uh, kind of networking stuff, as you could call it. Next slide, please. Then I, in, in, I was on the board in Seoul in Korea, um, South Korea. Um, next slide. Which again was a, was a center looking at telematics. Um, it was uh, funded by the main telecommunications company uh, in in uh, Seoul, in Korea. And uh, there I tried to develop, um, again, a sort of structure, a, a concept um, for uh, what I call the energetic core uh, of a creative, uh, of a creative uh, organism that could be made up uh, largely of artists, 
uh, with scientists and, and writers and thinkers and so on. Um, I'm just showing you these things really, they each call for a lecture, but to indicate the, the sorts of, you know, really endless possibilities to, that are afforded if one once gets rid of the old structures of art schools and art education and, and, and the narrowness of it. Um, but, but how, on the other hand, it doesn't just become freewheeling and, and flying around, but has some kind of structure invested in, 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 in the knowledge and understanding of science and nature, which now is afforded. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, and then in Vienna, Later, I, I took on a professor in the Hochschule for Angewandte Kunst. Next slide, please. Um, we called it, um, next slide. It was called the uh, Lair Council for Communication Theory. And I was able to run seminars with Australia um, and England and Austria uh, of, of students uh, with artists um, and um, and so on. So there I produced this connective model of interactive art practice, which I actually um, used in the original design of the Ars Electronica building. I was, we had a, a, a small board of half dozen people advising Ars Electronica on the development of their building. Uh, and this is some of the material that I uh, talked about, a, a kind of connectivist model of art practice, which took on board, not simply sort of form um, and, and so on, but you know, ideas of emergence, because it seems to me that emergence is, is, the, is the radical, uh, an interest in, in emergent meaning is the radical difference between the art of, of today and, and, the, and the earlier uh, art forms that preceded it. Next slide, please. Next slide. So that was Ars Electronica when they when we gave me that prize. It was nice. It gave me an opportunity to bring together um, a, a lot of the digital work, of course, which is what Ars Electronica is about, but also the interactive um, work um, that, that was uh, analog. Uh, and I didn't want to separate the two. I think the there is a continuum. Um, it's not either or anymore, I, I think. But it, what does what is the important thing is the viewer now is invested with the responsibility and the opportunity for creating meaning. Whereas there was an older model uh, of art and art history which said meaning of a work was to be learned and studied and acquired rather than created by the viewer. Next slide, please. Next slide. I, well, I can't go in detail, but just trying to say, you know, how, how when one gets into this field, um, you know, ideas about how one amplifies thought, designs identity, seeds, structures, and so on, comes as part of the package, as part of the field that we inherit from, from the digital past as we move into a post-digital uh, and more biological uh, a future. Um, the, these, these, these elements and relationships are important. Next slide, please. You know, I, I, next slide. So then, um, uh, uh, twenty years ago, I set up in uh, based in um, Plymouth University something called the Planetary Collegium. Um, and basically, what it was, it allowed artists um, from all over the world to come together um, three or four times a year um, to meet face to face, but the rest of the time to be online in developing their PhD research. We've had. I have over 80 graduates who, who achieved the PhD um, within this, within this uh, process. Next slide, please. Uh, and so nodes, so you can't, it can only be done, of course, with small groups when they meet face to face. So small groups were formed into what we called nodes um, in, in, um, in uh, Zurich, um, uh, in, in Milan, um, and uh, in Trento eventually, uh, and so on, and, and, and uh, various parts of the world. And, and with it, every year, a, a, an international conference uh, called Consciousness Reframed. Um, ne ne next, next slide, please. Um, sorry. Um, uh, next slide. I, I won't go into the details of that. Um, next slide. Next slide. 
it, it seemed to me that in these changing times, it was important for artists, all artists, to be able to engage in, in theorize or, or considering their practice within a larger framework. Next slide, please. And then uh, 10 years ago, um, next slide. Um, I'm, I set up in Shanghai my studio. Um, you, you invited to, to you could visit with that um, website address there, um, which is to create a, a four-year program um, based on technoetic um, principles, uh, offering a technoetic arts a four-year four-year program. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, next slide. Sorry. Next slide. Uh, this is the. This gives you an idea of the um, structure on which the four-year program is be is built. You see, it looks at as in as in the early days, behavior, identity, environment, uh, looking at questions of collaboration, connectivity, construction, and and uh, creating syncretic strategies looking at paradigms of art, the sort of things you expect, um, but also making cyberception, that is all these new forms of perception that we have, where we see further into space, uh, deeper into matter and so on, um, how that creates new kinds of awareness, uh, which I call cyberception. So cyberception, uh, technoetic discourse, cybernetics, um, and, and all these questions of behavior are absolutely built together into this, uh, this four-year program. And of course, with it, I have not just teachers from around the world, um, uh, but also uh, Chinese, the benefit of Chinese artists and Chinese thought, which for me is hugely valuable, both um, uh, theoretically and philosophically uh, and actually politically. Uh, together in, in, in looking at, at the organism and creativity uh, of, of the organism. Next slide, please. This is some of the students, just some random pictures, the sort of things they engage in and build and ways of, of, of learning and, and interacting. Next slide. Next slide. More and more of the same. <laughs> Next slide. So just briefly, I'm, I'm hoping, um, uh, if I if I uh, if I if I may say so, um, to to Delmo that the, the view this might be available to students if they were and and others if they were interested eventually. So obviously, I don't need I can't read all this stuff out, but I am pointing here, trying to show there's been a shift, you know, in the early days from modernism to, to postmodernism, which was very big in, in the middle of last century until this field now, which I practice now, which I call syncretic, uh, which takes on board many, many changes. I, I'm, I, I'm not going to go through it. It's a lecture in itself. But I think there is a shift. It's a major shift uh, in our understanding. Um, and and uh, uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, so this is a talk about the multidisciplinarity within um, universities and art schools, but uh, I think the linking systems of thought, which link all these areas of science, performance, art, biology, technology, and architecture together, has to be cybernetic, in fact, technoetic, telematic, and eventually will then be syncretic. So these are the binding elements, te telematic, cybernetics, technoetics, that can bring together the sciences and the forms of art and architecture within an educational framework. Next slide. Next slide. And architecture as well, but I, let's move on. It's just to say that architecture should also consider um, that buildings could grow from bottom up. Next slide, please. I have to move through, I'm, I'm short of time, I know. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so, well, reality is becoming both, I mean, art uh, 
is becoming both immaterial and moist, numinous and grounded, embodied and distributed. Um, and uh, this is again is a is is a way of trying to understand this new world that we're entering into, um, but which actually embraces all those sort of practices. I'm, I'm trying to avoid this idea that we're running headlong into sort of an AI, a VR world, um, and all other attributes of, of uh, cognition uh, and, and practice and creativity are sort of left behind. Uh, the hand is forgotten, the machine takes precedence, uh, the mind is forgotten, artificial intelligence. And I, I'm looking for a more rounded, more holistic mm -hmm. view of how we move forward. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> so this was when I introduced this idea of moist media uh, for the exhibition, which um, very kindly uh, Richard Kreischer in, in Austria invited me into. It was, a, it was in Graz, I think. Um, it was a sort of celebration of um, the year 2000 that we were making in, in that some of the wonderful caves in, in, in there that the exhibition took place. Um, oh, we've slipped onto the next slide, which is fine, um, because um, uh, it's to say that uh, moist media now and bio art, of course, is, is now being practiced all over the place, and, and we're very familiar with those developments. Um, but I think um, moist media, you know, which is a combination of, of the wet, moist, natural systems uh, and electronic, digital, um, uh, quantum systems, coming together. That's the, that's the reality of it. Um, next slide, please. Um, but, but in all of that, because I, I'm, I'm not going to give a talk on bio art, uh, and I'm not uh, qualified to do so, and that's not part of this. But within it, let me say, I think that biophotonics will play a hugely important <laughs> part over the next 10 15, 20 years, even in art practice, because um, uh, Fritz Albert Popp, he died recently, very sadly, but um, uh, he had, um, I forget quite where, I made a visit once in, in, in uh, Germany, um, this laboratory looking at biophysics, uh, um, uh, um, uh, the way in which um, photobiology, as we could call it, is being the biophotonics, uh, um, uh, uh, or what he were he was concerned with this idea that actually the organizing principle of the body is through light and the behavior of light and the instruction of light and it seems to me I'm just giving a little clue here to where I think we might be moving uh, in the future as bio art develops we would look not just to the cellular and and to the wet organisms but to to light and to um, and to biophotonics within the system. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, I mean, just to go, um, physics has been mentioned in, in previous um, presentations and, and so on, uh, and, and uh, uh, very, very important it is. But let, let's, uh, I think what is important that, that Hans-Peter Dorr, for example, and many other physicists are telling us, that the world has a holistic structure. Um, it, it, it's it, quantum physics. Uh, matter is not composed of, of matter. It's, it, it's composed of potentiality. Reality is potential. That's exactly the point of the art we produce now. Whether it's a fixed image or a moving image or an interactive space, it, it demands of the viewer that meaning should be made through that interaction not that the meaning is given by the artist. I think that's the important thing. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next, yeah. Um, and so very briefly, just to say that, of course, we've, we've understood very, VR in English has been used to talk about virtual reality, um, which we know what that is. I think we have to think about validated reality. That's the one, that's the Newtonian reality. And there's vegetal reality, which is, I call it entheogenic, that's to say, the reality that comes about through chemical, by, through natural um, putting 
chem in the chemistry uh, of the brain. But, you know, at one time we kept them all separate. People would go off to a little room and put something on and be in virtual reality or do this. But nowadays, there's begun to, uh, more and more there's a flow between all these. Reality is variable. Um, we've constantly got that, that little thing in our hand, that little phone, uh, which is taking us everywhere than where we are at that moment at the same time as that moment. And of course, that phone will be in our wrist and in the body, of course, within 10 years. But nevertheless, whether it is or not, um, we're moving constantly between uh, realities all the time, it seems to me. And so reality is now become variable. Next slide, please. Um, and next slide, please. Um, yeah, I mean, these, these are things I, 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 I've got to move on. Uh, the planet was telematic and these are things I've talked about. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so I've talked about moist media and syncretism. Next slide. Just summing up now. Slide. Next slide, please. So one final point I want to make, which I think is, 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 is interesting as artists and in terms of education, is that is that we're no longer a single self-organism. Um, we're, as I, our identities are becoming permeable and transparent. Um, and I think the idea of what the self is, is being redefined. I think art is playing a part in that. But basically we're engaged in constructing many selves and I think the more we go into ourselves as well, the more selves we should discover. So uh, I, really it's basic to say if we're talking about education, we're talking about art, we're talking about the future and development, we have to recognize that the self is no longer fixed, but the self is generative. And I think that has implications uh, for art, where we are in this endless state of, of becoming. Next slide, please. Next slide. So just to sum up, um, I'm not going to read that out, but this map really s sets out the relationship now that, that shows this variable reality and the elements uh, that feed into it uh, in, in the space, which I think um, it will inform uh, any development of, uh, of educational uh, enterprises, particularly what we would still call art schools, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, will inform the development of, of design practice, of architecture, and so on and so forth. Um, so that, I'm sorry to have rushed through all these issues, um, but I've used the time as, as, and I am grateful for the time I've been given. Um, I'm very grateful for your attention um, and, uh, uh, and for this opportunity, uh, as I say again, uh, to talk to you. Thank you very, very much indeed.